the 19th century, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was born into a noble family in Ukraine. As a child, young Helena displayed a gift for clairvoyance, as well as an interest in metaphysical phenomena. Years later, she traveled throughout Europe, the Middle East and India, studying with various teachers and Sufi saints. Following the guidance of an Indian yogi named Mahatma Morya, Madame Blavatsky co-founded the Theosophical Society. Theosophy, meaning divine wisdom, refers to knowledge that comes through spiritual experience rather than intellectual understanding alone. The Theosophical Society is dedicated to uplifting humanity through a realization of the oneness of life and the wisdom underlying all religions. Madame Blavatsky wrote several important books on Theosophy, including Isis Unveiled, The Secret Doctrine, The Key to Theosophy, and The Voice of the Silence. The Secret Doctrine, published in 1888, is considered the Bible of Theosophy and the source book of esoteric tradition. Although she was credited as being the author of The Secret Doctrine, Madame Blavatsky often expressed that she only conveyed the ancient wisdom that was passed on to her. The true authors of the work were her teachers, the Mahatmas, or great souls, who were the guardians of the secret wisdom of the ages. Today on Words of Wisdom, we invite you to join us for excerpts from The Races with the Third Eye from Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine. Mazdin Symbolism The subject is so unusual, the paths pursued so intricate, so full of dangerous pitfalls prepared by adverse theories and criticism, that good reasons have to be given for every step taken. While turning the light of the bullseye, called esotericism, on almost every inch of the occult grounds traveled over, we have also to use its lens to throw into a stronger objectivity the regions explored by exact science. This not only in order to contrast the two, but to defend our position. It may be complained by some that too little is said of the physical, human side of the extinct races in this history of their growth and evolution. Much more might be said assuredly if simple prudence did not make us hesitate at the threshold of every new revelation, that which finds its possibility and landmarks in the discoveries of modern science is given, all that of which exact knowledge knows nothing and upon which it is unable to speculate and therefore denies as facts in nature is withheld. But even such statements as these, for example, that of all the mammalians, man was the earliest, that it is man who is the indirect ancestor of the ape, and that he was a kind of a cyclops in days of old, will all be contested, yet scientists will never be able to prove, except to their own satisfaction, that it was not so. Nor can they admit that the first two races of man were too ethereal and phantom-like in their constitution, organism and shape even to be called physical men. For if they do, it will be found that this is one of the reasons why their relics can never be expected to be exhumed among other fossils. Nevertheless, all this is maintained. Man was the storehouse, so to speak, of all the seeds of life for this round, vegetable and animal alike. As in Sof, infinity is one notwithstanding the innumerable forms which are in him. So is man on earth the microcosm of the macrocosm. As soon as man appeared, everything was complete. For everything is comprised in man. He unites in himself all forms. The mystery of the earthly man is after the mystery of the heavenly man. The human form, so called because it is the vehicle under whatever shape of the divine man, is, as so intuitionally remarked by the author of esoteric studies, the new type, 
at the beginning of every round, as man never can be, so he never has been, manifested in a shape belonging to the animal kingdom in essay, or essential nature. The author proceeds, he never formed part of that kingdom, derived only derived from the most finished class of the latter. A new human form must always have been the new type of the cycle. The human shape in one ring, as I imagine, becomes cast off clothes in the next. It is then appropriated by the highest order in the servant kingdom below. If the idea is what we understand it to mean, for the rings spoken of throw some confusion upon it, then it is the correct esoteric teaching. Having appeared at the very beginning, and at the head of sentient and conscious life, man, the astral, or the soul, for the Zohar, repeating the archaic teaching, distinctly says that the real man is the soul, and his material frame no part of him. Man became the living and animal unit, from which the cast of clothes determined the shape of every life and animal in this round. Thus, he created for ages the insects, reptiles, birds, and animals, and consciously to himself, from his remains and relics from the third and the fourth rounds. The same idea and teaching are as distinctly given in the Vandidad of the Mazdeans, as they are in the Chaldean and the Mosaic allegory of the Ark, all of which are the many national versions of the original legend given in the Hindu scriptures. It is found in the allegory of Vaivashvata Manu and his Ark with the seven Rishis, as in that of the Rishis, each of whom is shown the father and progenitor of specified animals, reptiles and even monsters. Open the Mazdin Vendidad at Fargar 2 at verse 27 and read the command of Ormats to Yima, a spirit of the earth who symbolizes the three races, after telling him to build a vara, an enclosure, an argwa, or vehicle. Thither into the vara, thou shalt bring the seeds of man and woman, of the greatest, best, and finest kinds on this earth. Thither thou shalt bring the seeds of every kind of cattle, etc., etc. And all those seeds shalt thou bring, two of every kind, to be kept inexhaustible there, so long as those men shall stay in the Vara. Those men in the Vara are the progenitors, the heavenly men or the Ani, the future egos who are commissioned to inform mankind. For Vara, or the Ark, or again the vehicle, simply means men. Verse 30 says, Thou shalt seal up the Vara, after filling it up with the seeds and thou shalt make a door and a window self-shining within, which is the soul. And when Yima inquires of Ahura Mazda how he shall manage to make that vara, he is answered, Crush the earth and knead it with thy hands, as the potter does when kneading the potter's clay. Perceptive viewers, it's been a pleasure to have you with us today on Words of Wisdom.